All right. All right, hey everyone, thanks for joining me today. Uh, this is my first time doing Facebook Live with live stream, so I apologize if there's any technical difficulties. Feel free to let me know. Let's see. All right. Uh, so today we're going to go over some winter hiking basics. And uh, for those of you who are new to Reach Your Summit and also uh, to myself, I'm a professional guide. I've been leading trips for about 12 years now around New England with Reach Your Summit. We do day hikes, backpacking trips, kayaking, uh, work with all skill levels and abilities around Connecticut, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Vermont. And I also do coaching and consultations with a lot of through hikers and also people that are just looking to get out. So I have a lot of experience with that, but also I've been backpacking for about 24 years now, all around various environments and areas. Uh, most recently around New England with Reach Your Summit as well. So today we're going to go over winter hiking basics, things that I'll do in preparation for a day hike around Connecticut or Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Vermont, and so on. We'll go over some of the gear that I really enjoy using and the things that I look for, some tips, and I'll also uh, go over any questions that you have. If you have any that aren't addressed during this event, uh, you can also contact me at reachyoursummit.net or you can email me at mattjovin at reachyoursummit.net. So uh, the first thing that I'll do with any trip that I'm planning, whether it's a day hike here in Connecticut or anywhere else, even with backpacking, is research. I feel research is going to be one of the most important things that you can focus on for your trip planning to allow you to have a safe and enjoyable experience. There's very little that you can do with mistakes and get by in the winter time if they do end up happening. It's a little easier to have something happen during three season trips, but the saying goes, winter is a full-time occupation, so you're always doing things to stay warm. You're always doing things to stay comfortable and dry and not get cold or end up having hypothermia or any types of uh, issues like that. So with research, what I'll do is I'll first I'll look at the area that I'm planning on going to. I'll plan my goals and objectives out and then I'll start looking online. I'll look at weather history for the area. I'll look at precipitation, uh, how many daylight hours I have. So around the winter time, we're running into fewer daylight hours and uh, there's you know less daylight, so things can go wrong and you can end up getting cold very quickly once the, the daylight drops. So I'll look at that, I'll look at wildlife, I'll look at the terrain, whether I'm hiking on just solid ground or if I do have snow or ice added to that terrain with the mix. Uh, I'll also look at possible natural hazards. Things are a little more exposed in the winter time. You don't have any leaf cover. Uh, so I'll also look at my sun exposure while I'm out. I'll definitely add on some sunblock and some lip balm, things of that nature. And uh, I'll also look at possible uh, insects that I could come across. In the winter time, we can still run into ticks during certain times of the year. So uh, those are all things that I'll look at ahead of time and I can do that with Google. I can look online. I can watch the weather reports. I can look at guidebooks, which I feel are very important. Look at the maps for the areas that I'm going to be hiking in. 
uh, maybe I have past experience hiking in specific locations that I'm going back to so I can use that research and that information that I've gathered from that past trip. I can ask friends, I can ask fellow hikers, online forums, all of that information I'll look at before I even start putting together the gear that I'm going to be bringing with me for a specific trip. Other things that I'll take into consideration will be uh, risks that are known with winter travel. So am I traveling to an area up north, say in New Hampshire, where avalanches could pose a threat? Uh, am I going to be hiking in an area that's very remote? That's another thing that I'll consider. Uh, also, the type of travel that I'm going to be doing. Am I going to be hiking? Am I going to be hiking with traction devices like crampons or micro spikes, snowshoes, cross-country skis? Uh, how familiar am I with that type of travel? How slow am I going to be? In the winter time, everything is going to take double the effort and double the time that it would in most three season conditions for many people. Another thing that I'll look at when I'm doing trip planning in the winter time is what's known as a time control plan. So in general three season conditions, let's say we're all hiking at a modest two mile an hour pace uh, and for every thousand feet in elevation gain you want to add about 30 minutes of additional time onto your time plan for that elevation climb. So if we're hiking say two miles and we have a thousand feet of elevation gain within that two miles, how long is it going to take us? Well we're hiking two miles an hour so there's an hour right there and then we have that thousand feet of elevation gain within those two miles so that adds an extra hour and a half. So it would take us about an hour and a half generally to get through that couple of miles with that elevation climb. It's certainly going to be different for a, another area. If you're up north, you have steeper elevation grades. You might have the snow and ice. So I would shrink that uh, hiking pace down maybe to a mile an hour and then add in that elevation gain, taking lots of breaks. You want to hike very slowly you don't want to overdo it and exert yourself to the point where you're sweating a lot because then that'll add into the risk of hypothermia or also possibly getting frostbite due to exposure and sweating a lot as well. Um, I was hoping to share a screen with you here because I had a PowerPoint set up to go over the gear. So I'm just going to go through that and then we'll get into the gear as well. Um, so. A couple of other things that you'll want to look at. You want to be very careful not to be in an area that's prone to possibly having that happening. Uh, the same thing happens on our roads. We get lots of potholes on the roads when we're driving just from the freeze and thaw of ice and the pavement cracking and just kind of exploding or, or breaking apart. The same thing can happen on the trail. So if you come across a stone shelter, you might want to avoid that. Anything with a stone roof, you might want to avoid that in certain conditions. And also take that into consideration with the area that you're traveling in. If the area is known to be very rocky, you might have to factor that into your travel time plan as well because you might end up having that freeze thaw of rocks or rocks dislodging, things of that nature. So once I've looked at all of that, I'll also start putting together a gear list and it's not going to be very extensive because I'm doing a day hike. It's definitely going to vary. My gear list is never the same for any type of trip. I'm always adding and removing things to that gear list, but it won't be as extensive as a backpacking trip. So the first thing that I'll start with is going to be a base layer. So you want to avoid cotton. 
this is merino wool uh, and short sleeve. So what I've learned over the years with winter cycling is uh, if you go with long sleeves, what happens is you could end up getting sweat going down your wrist into your gloves. And the same thing happens to me when I'm winter hiking, just because I typically sweat a lot, even when I'm not exerting myself uh, a lot. So I'll look for something short sleeve. I'll avoid cotton with all of this gear that I'm going to be going over. Cotton is very bad performance in the winter time. If it gets wet, it gets very heavy. It takes a long time to dry and it will not keep you warm if it does end up getting soaked or wet. So no blue jeans, no cotton t-shirts, no cotton long sleeve shirts or flannel shirts that are made out of cotton. You want to keep that stuff at home. So I'll start off with a short sleeve shirt. I'm a big fan of natural fibers. So this is merino wool. You can also go with bamboo, you can go with silk, you can go with hemp, any of those materials, or you can go with a synthetic material, something like nylon, polyester, uh, and things like that. A lot of them are going to dry very quickly. Uh, synthetic materials are going to dry a little more quicker than natural fibers in most cases but I like the feel of the natural fibers. A lot of them are also antimicrobial, so it helps with reducing odor and bacteria compared to polyester or nylon material. A lot of those will have a treatment to it for odor barriers, but I find that they still end up getting that stink factor after a while. So merino wool, short sleeve shirt, this is going to be my next to skin layer, my base layer. It's going to wick away sweat, keep my skin dry, keep me comfortable while I'm exerting myself out on a winter hike. My next layer is going to be uh, insulation layer. This is going to be, again, same thing, natural fibers, or you can go with synthetic fibers. This is a lightweight microgrid fleece. I'm a big fan of fleece in the winter time. If fleece gets wet, it still does a decent job at keeping you uh, warm to a certain extent. And it will dry a little quicker than the other two that I'm about to go over. It will get a little heavier than the other two in most cases, but I'm willing to sacrifice that to have something that'll dry very quickly. The other insulation layer that you could go with if you don't want to go with a fleece is a puffy jacket. So you can go with a down jacket, a synthetic jacket. I typically will leave this inside of my pack. I'll carry this as extra insulation in the event I want to stop and take a break or if I need to wait out a storm that's passing or I'm hanging around for a little while with a group, I'll end up putting this on just to keep the cold from bothering me if it's very windy out or if it does get wet. Synthetic, in my opinion, shines really well here in the northeast over down, but I do like the warmth to weight ratio that you get with down. Uh, so synthetic jacket, puffy jacket, whether it's uh, synthetic or if you decide to go with down, that could be another good insulation option as well. So on top of that, I'm going to go with a rain shell. This is going to protect the insulation layer and the base layer from the elements. It's also going to protect me. It's going to give me a good wind barrier, a good barrier from precipitation, whether that ends up being freezing rain or snow. And uh, just works really well at, at giving me protection. Something with a hood is something that I look for and you want it to be waterproof breathable. You don't want it to be water resistant or wind resistant. If you end up getting caught in snow or freezing rain or rain in the cold, it's going to soak through that fabric very quickly. 
waterproof breathable materials will give you water protection for a while before it ends up starting to soak through. Nothing is going to be 100% waterproof and 100% breathable in my experience. You can't have your cake and eat it too. You kind of sacrifice one for the other and you just kind of deal with mitigating the effects the best that you can. Same thing for my bottom layers. So in mild cold, I'll go with a fleece line cycling pant. This will again work like the fleece that I have for uh, my insulation layer for my upper torso. This will give me a good range of movement. You can use running tights. You can use base layer pants if you wanted to. You can do a three layer system like the upper body that I just showed you and go with a base layer and then something for insulation if you find that you run very cold. I try not to overdo it. A lot of these layers that I've showed you already are going to be very thin just because of the fact that I run warm and sweat a lot in general. So having something that can wick away really quickly, dry quickly, is going to be more beneficial for me. If I start bulking up on the insulation with running very warm and sweating a lot, I'm going to end up possibly putting myself in one of those bad risks that I went over earlier. And then for the outer shell, I'm going to do the same thing with a windproof, waterproof, breathable pant to protect that layer from getting soaked or saturated. Because it's a cycling pant, it does have water and wind resistance, but it's not going to be 100%, so I will put that shell over if I'm expecting really bad weather. For socks, merino wool socks, nylon socks, synthetic, whatever you choose. You can go with a thin sock and then go with a thicker sock over that if you wanted to, just as a sock liner and then having something uh, for insulation. You can also go with what's known as a vapor barrier liner. So let me pull one of those out of my bag here. Vapor barrier liners are exactly what they sound like. They are not allowing the vapor to transmit and breathe through the fabric. So it kind of traps it. It gives you a little bit of moisture. It gives you kind of a, a very warm climate inside of your socks, inside of your gloves. And it's not going to be breathable, but in the winter time, if you're moving slowly, you shouldn't be sweating as much as you would during really hot conditions. So I'll just use a slow cooker liner bag to go around my hands or go around my feet. You can use bread bags if you wanted to. You can use plastic shopping bags. If you find that you run really cold, this is a great low cost option that's reusable and allows you to have protection from the cold and also getting soaked through if your socks start sweating a lot. So with the socks, I'll rotate these halfway through the day if I'm doing a long hike. If I'm doing a short hike, I'll just wear the one pair that I have on and I'll throw another pair in my pack just in case with my additional insulation. And merino wool for socks work really well for me at preventing blistering. They're a good temperature regulator for the type of material. So it'll keep me warm when it's cool. It'll keep me cool when it's warm. And it has a lot of versatility. And again, the antimicrobial factor as well. For my head, I'll wear a merino wool cap on some trips just for the same properties that I mentioned with the socks. I'll also wear a gator or a, a buff, sorry, a tubular seamless piece of fabric around the neck. This has over a hundred uses. I can turn it into a beanie if I wanted to. I can also use it uh, to tie a tourniquet if I need to, a balaclava, neck gator. It has 
many, many uses. Merino wool, again, for the cold, I find works really well. And then if I, it's really windy out, I can go with a balaclava. This will give me better protection if I don't have a buff, if, if I don't have a tubular piece of fabric. This has a hinge on it, so I can pull that down and be able to eat, take a break, have some water or snack while I'm hiking. I can cover my nose back up when I'm hiking if it gets really windy with the wind block. It does help a lot. And this is fleece line too, so it's going to give me a, a good amount of moisture wicking and also warmth. And on some trips, if the conditions vary, I might even just throw that right inside of my pack to have as uh, additional protection should I need it. And for gloves, I'll wear a pair of liner gloves or I might pack liner gloves in my pack. And if you want to take pictures or text or things like that while you're out, you might want to find something that has uh, tech compatibility so you can use the phone while you're still wearing them and not worry about getting your fingertips frozen. Uh, but on most trips, I'll wear a pair of gauntlet gloves. These are insulated and Gore-Tex, so again, the waterproof, breathable, windproof factor with these gloves and still giving me a good range of movement. I run warm, so this works for me. If you tend to run cold, you might want to go with a mitt or wear a mitten over something thin like this so that way you can trap extra heat with the mitt keeping your fingers close together but then you can pull your mitten off and still use your fingers if you want to grab a snack or use your phone and not worry about your hands getting really cold or exposed to the elements. Then getting into footwear. Uh, footwear is going to be a very personal choice. So on most trips, I'm wearing zero drop footwear, like ultra lone peaks. I find they work really well for me. You might be completely different. So here I have a non-waterproof three season pair that I would not wear in the winter time. Uh, just what I wear for three season trips, but I transition to a higher mid height version of that shoe that's waterproof breathable and it's not going to be insulated. So if you run cold, something like this might not work for you. But the fact that I run warm, I don't have any issues with that. I can wear that in very cold winter conditions and still have water protection, snow protection things like that. If I'm going up north, I might go with something that's more insulated and more appropriate for the time of year and conditions. If you find that you run cold, you might want to just go with a winter insulated hiking boot overall. And in very intense conditions, I'll upgrade to a mountaineering boot, something that's insulated and very stiff because I might need a crampon for the uh, steep exposed ice and alpine type environment that I might encounter, say, in the presidential range in New Hampshire. Outside of my footwear, I'll wear a pair of gaiters. These go all the way up to my kneecaps, and they go outside of the boot. So it keeps all of the snow from going down into the top of my boot, keeps my socks nice and dry. It also acts as a good wind block and might help trap a little more heat to keep that part of your legs warmer. And uh, just keeps everything dry and clean and very beneficial in most winter trips. I'll throw this in my pack if I'm not needing it. Uh, but most of the time, I'll just wear it. If you're snowshoeing or if you're just hiking in general, you might be kicking up snow a lot. And I don't want that going up under my rain pant and end up getting inside of uh, my footwear. So gaiters are going to be very important. Uh, on top of going with those, 
if you do run cold, you could always go with an insulated winter hiking pant or an insulated winter uh, jacket that has a waterproof breathable barrier on the outside. But I like having the versatility of being able to adapt to the changing conditions. And the fact that I run warm is why I choose gear like what I just went over. Uh, on top of that, face mask. This is very important for all of us now with everything going on. National parks are making it mandatory. Crossing state lines, it's mandatory now. Uh, so I'll carry something like that. Uh, so that is clothing. Then for additional protection for my eyes, I might go with a pair of uh, glacier glasses or just regular sunglasses, something with very low light transmission, just due to the fact that you're getting a lot of that glare that you get while you're out driving in your car. You get that same thing out on the trail, especially if the area is very exposed to sunlight and doesn't have a lot of tree cover or, or boulders covering the area where it's shaded. Uh, so something like that will reduce the glare. It'll protect my eyes. Everything's going to be more intense when it's reflecting off of the snow. So you definitely want to do that. If it's going to be very windy out and I'm expecting very bad conditions, possibly a snow squall coming through, or just the wind in general, then I'll go with a pair of goggles. And these are just ski goggles. I also use these for winter cycling. Clear lenses for overcast conditions or if I'm doing any night riding. But for day hikes, I can switch out the lenses if it's very sunny out and go with something that's going to be more appropriate to reduce the glare and I don't have the sunlight hitting me right in the eyes. Uh, the goggles will also give me additional warmth in my face and also block the wind. Then for footwear, for traction, I will always, always carry a pair of traction with me based on my research that I've done before I head out on the trail, no matter what I'm expecting, just because of how icy certain spots might get in the winter and I might not be aware of it until I'm actually out there and forced to have to kind of travel it along it. So for technical hiking, I'll wear something like this. This is going to be a Cthulhu Micro Spikes. I've been wearing these for years and they're great for moderate technical hikes. Say if you're hiking like Bear Mountain up in Connecticut, these might work really well as long as you're not going up or down the north face of Bear Mountain and you're just doing say the under mountain trail up to the AT really hilly terrain, these really shine. If I'm going to be doing something a little bit easier and something that's a little more flat or there's less of a technical aspect to the hike, then I might go with something a little less intense where I can still walk on pavement or rail trails or things like that. Uh, these are the micro uh, Catula Exo spikes, very lightweight and still giving me a good amount of traction on hard pack ice and snow without being super technical, full of roots and rocks where the Catula micro spikes would be a better option. And then if I'm out, as I mentioned with the mountaineering boots up north in New Hampshire areas where it's really intense, then I'll go with a pair of actual climbing crampons that work with a really stiff piece of footwear. If I'm hiking on really steep, icy conditions, say like going up Mount Washington in the winter time. 
Another option for snow travel, if the snow is really deep, all of those that I showed you are not going to help at all. And you might need something more appropriate like a snowshoe. So after the recent snow that we had, I actually just took these out a few days ago. And having a bigger platform like this is going to flatten the snow underneath you and allow you to travel a lot more efficiently, less effort. You won't be post holing. You won't be uh, causing issues for other hikers when things like that refreeze. Uh, this is a great way to leave no trace. And there are various different models that you can go with and options. The traction is going to be uh, based on the area that you're traveling in. You might want to go with something a little more aggressive for technical terrain, a little less aggressive for easier, flatter terrain. I will say, uh, with all the options out there, you can choose whatever you'd like. But if you do see yourself hiking and rolling hills and terrain like that, look for something with a heel lift bar. This will just take some of the stress off of your Achilles and your calves when you're doing those hill climbs and make things a little bit easier for you. You can use snowshoes like the ones I just showed you on flat, icy, snowpack terrain too if you wanted to, but it might reduce your pace. It might be feel a little bulky and a little bit of overkill if you're hiking on flat terrain like that. Then I'll use a pair of trekking poles. And this is going to give me good stability with my pack, with carrying all of this stuff. It's going to give me good traction. It's going to help with the snowshoes or the micro spikes or any type of traction device that I'm using. If I need it, I don't want to end up falling over and possibly soaking all of my clothes or getting hurt in general. Then I'll go with a sleeping pad or just a nice, what I like to use this for is a sit pad, just a thin foam pad. Uh, this is by a brand called Gossamer Gear and and then pull it out when I need to and sit down on a wet log or sit down on the snow and stay nice and dry. If I am in an emergency, I can lay this completely out and lay down on it and have a good amount of protection from the cold. It's not going to give you a lot of insulation just because of how thin it is, but it's better than laying on the snow in general, just on its own. Along with that, I'll carry a bivy with me. So this is going to be basically a sleeping bag sack with a little bit of structure to it. This is waterproof breathable. So in the event I get caught out in a really bad snowstorm, I can set this up very quickly. I can put that sleeping pad in there or that foam pad at the bottom and just get in there and hunker down until the storm passes. If I fall and get hurt or somebody I'm out with gets hurt, I can set that shelter up, give them a little bit of protection so they don't become hypothermic. I can have them lay down on that pad. I can also use a pack liner, which I'm going to show you in just a moment, as additional barrier to help trap heat, similar to the vapor barrier liner that I showed you with the socks and handwear as well. Uh, so bivvies are great. They're not for everyone. It's kind of like laying down inside of a coffin, but they're nice and light and packable and great protection from the elements, especially out in exposed times of year like you are in the winter time. So I will always carry something like this with me for even just a winter day hike as an emergency shelter. Additional emergency gear. You might want to consider 
uh, satellite communication device. So these are both going to be very different in their performance and the features they offer. This one is going to be a one-way satellite messaging device. Both of them work different from what my cell phone works on. So if I do end up having to wait out a storm in that emergency shelter, something happens, I can contact rescue with this by pushing this red SOS button here and they'll get a location ping and they'll see where the message was sent and be able to come out and, and assist me when it's appropriate and when they're able to in a safe manner. And I can also preset messages at home with other buttons and send it out to contacts on my list and let people know I'm okay. This is a one-way messenger, so I cannot message back and forth with people. If I have the message on there saying I made it to camp, wish I had more Snickers, and I keep hitting that button, they're going to keep getting that same message. If something happened to my leg, they're still going to get that Snickers message. So this is one-way preset messaging uh, that you have. With this device, this is actually a two-way messenger, so I can actually do real-time messaging and let somebody know exactly what's going on. Again, I could also push the SOS button and get rescue. This also specifically shows me what the current weather is and what the weather predictions are. And I can pair it with my phone as well. So. Uh, let me pull that up on my phone. So I can pair it with my phone. There's an app right here. And I can go to messages and I can start just typing a message to anybody like I would if I were using a, a texting app on my phone. And again, this works on a different satellite network. So I don't have to worry about losing cell service. I can still reach out to people and let them know what's going on or let them know I'm okay. And both of these devices also have tracking, so you can do live tracking, keep it on, and let people follow your, your trip and see where you are and make sure that you're okay. Both great options, uh, great peace of mind, cheap life insurance. They are a little expensive, but compared to what it could cost for other things, this is definitely something I will always have on me, whether I'm hiking alone or with a group for any time of year, not just the winter time. So having something like that will be bene beneficial to all of you for your hiking. Uh, hand warmer packets, great to have in case of an emergency or in case you start to get cold. They work really well. You can also go with something that's USB rechargeable and use that. For winter hikes, I might also bring a small stove and cook pot just so I can make some hot chocolate while I'm taking a break if I wanted to. I have fuel canister in here and a stove and then my pot. Boil some water up. If I run out of water, I can collect snow or ice and keep melting that down inside of my cook pot until I have enough drinking water. I might also consider bringing a thermos already filled with coffee or hot chocolate for my hike, and then I can just drink from that when I need to. Uh, for water, I'm a big fan of Nalgene's in the winter time. Any other time of year, I don't like using them just because they're extra heavy compared to a lot of other options out there and very bulky. But in winter time, I feel they're indispensable. So I'll have water inside of here. And then I might take a wool sock or you can get a neoprene sleeve made specifically for them for insulation. And I'll just slide my sock right over that bottle and I can store it upside down inside of my pack so that way any air that's inside of the bottle is going to be up near the top and it's going to reduce the likelihood that my lid will freeze. 
and allow me to still have drinking water. Another way to reduce freezing inside of these is to go with warmer water. So if you do have a stove, maybe boil it, let it cool a little bit so it's just kind of lukewarm and then throw it inside of here. Uh, you can also put boiling water inside of these and they won't melt or get damaged. And also I find powdery juice mixes work well too with uh, lower working down to a lower temperature rating under freezing before it starts freezing in general. So a couple of tricks to keep your water from freezing while you're out. If I don't want to boil water, I'll always carry some type of way to treat water in the event that water is still flowing or I want to melt snow down and I run out of fuel and maybe I'm warming the snow with my body heat or things like that. Uh, this is chlorine dioxide. They are in droplet liquid form. I've been able to work with this down to about 15 degrees Fahrenheit by putting it inside of my pocket and using it only when I need to. In the event this does freeze or the bottles crack or I lose one, I will still carry some chlorine dioxide tablets just to have as an emergency backup. I will not use a water filter below freezing because the filter, the pores and everything inside of the filter can have the same, same effect that the rocks will have with the freeze thaw and it could end up damaging your filter and then you could end up having unsafe drinking water. So I'll carry something like that. You could also use a UV pen, but those rely on batteries and if those batteries go out in the, the cold, you're left with no safe drinking water. So I'll still go with something that I'm able to treat that. And hand sanitizer I'll have strapped outside of my pack for interim hand cleaning uh, moments when I'm out. I'll also carry a little bit of uh, powder just for if I'm sweating or you can do an anti-chafe healing balm. And as I mentioned, the sun exposure is going to be a lot higher when it's reflecting off of the snow and ice in the winter. So I'll go with a sunblock stick for exposed skin, and then I might go with some lip balm for my lips. I can also use it in a pinch to get a fire going. I can patch a, a little tiny pinhole in my rain jacket with lip balm and I can also use it as a lubricant if I have a zipper that ends up being stuck while I'm out there frozen. Then bathroom necessities, I'll carry a trowel with me, maybe some toilet paper or you can use a bidet if you wanted to carry one of those with you and use that with a water bottle. There are a lot of great lightweight options out there. With that, you don't have to worry about running out of toilet paper, but you also don't have to worry about burying that uh, underneath the snow and having that end up popping out in the springtime. Then I'll have this bag here. This is my small ditty bag. And in here I have some first aid items, some gear repair, some emergency items. I have those vapor barrier liners that I showed you. I also like to carry some cords and an external battery pack. And also a silica gel packet or desiccant just to absorb any moisture with the electronics so they don't end up getting damaged while I'm out in the winter. And I can recharge my phone, I can recharge that satellite communication device I showed you. I can recharge my headlamp, which I'll always have with me. As I mentioned at the beginning of this uh, session, the daylight hours, the lack of daylight hours that we have. In the event I end up getting caught in the dark going back to my car, at least I'll have some lighting to see me down. I might also want to catch a sunrise or a sunset, so it would be beneficial with that. 
And that one is USB rechargeable. So having a way to recharge it if I need to would be beneficial for me. Then I have my knife and multi-tool. This has a pair of tweezers in it, some scissors, some screwdrivers, knife blade, everything that I need for minor emergency situations. And then I have a small Bic lighter just to start fire and a massage cork ball. This is great if I start to feel IT band issues or if I start to feel really uncomfortable out there sore, I can roll things out quickly while I'm taking a, a snack break. Then Uh, one of the most important things that I'm going to carry with me, no matter how familiar I am with an area that I'm traveling in, I'll carry a compass and I'll also carry a map just so I can get off trail if I need to and be able to get help if I need to, uh, seeing where, what my surroundings are, seeing where the water sources might be, where I might be able to seek shelter if I need to in the event of an emergency. No matter how familiar I am with a trail, I will always still bring a paper map with me. Apps are great. I'm a big fan of Gaia and uh, also uh, Komoot. And for cycling, I use Ride with GPS. And then with my satellite communication device, Garmin uh, has one called EarthMate. So I use those, but I use them as a secondary solution to double check my bearings, but I'll always carry a paper map with me and a compass. It'll never steer me in the wrong direction if I know how to use it. Uh, I do teach map and compass courses out on the trail with groups, so you can always check for those on Reach Your Summit's website. We do those throughout the year as well as the backpacking trips and hiking and things like that. Uh, with winter time, you can run into whiteout conditions and no matter how experienced or familiar you are with a trail, you could end up getting disoriented very quickly due to a snow squall or fog or just a big heavy snowstorm. And being able to see your surroundings and navigate safely to protection, whether there's a boulder nearby or trees or getting out of there and getting down safety to the trail uh, in your car would be very helpful and prevent anything from happening and make sure that you're safe and enjoying the experience. Uh, all of this stuff I would carry in a 20 to 35 liter pack should suffice for most winter trips around here in Connecticut. A 20 to 30 liter pack should be fine. If you're carrying extra items for other people and family, then you might want to go with something a little bit bigger. But you don't need to go too crazy with it. Up north, I would definitely carry a bigger pack, what might look like an overnight pack to some, just because I might also throw in a sleeping bag, things like that. I also mentioned the pack liner. So... I'm a big fan of trash compactor bags. I use these or uh, thin plastic like Nylaflume, uh, it's called. And I'll throw all of my gear inside of this and then put that in my pack and roll it up. And my pack might get hit with snow or freezing rain, but all of my stuff has always stayed dry. Even on three season trips where I'm hiking in the rain all day, I've never had stuff get wet at all. So, uh, using that would be great for your pack and then in that emergency situation if somebody got hurt or if I got hurt and I needed to set up that bivy, I can lay that pad out. I can slide this over part of my body, maybe cut a hole in the bottom if I need to. Very easily to re replace these when I get home. And then my pack I can slide over my feet and have a little bit of protection up to about my knees with my pack as well. It'll help trap heat and, and keep me safe and comfortable. Uh, and then 
some good resources for any of these areas that if you're looking to hike in. Um, the main mountain guide by the AMC is great. Uh, for winter hiking in Vermont, I really like using the Green Mountain Club's guide. For New Hampshire, the White Mountain Guide, this is a book with a bunch of maps. The main one has maps as well. And for Connecticut, our Connecticut Walkbook by Connecticut Forest and Park Association. This has all of the Blue Blaze trails in Connecticut, along with a lot of side trails. So that would be great to have. And I would just photocopy the map or take a picture of the map as well and have that on hand with me in a Ziploc bag while I'm out hiking on the trail. Uh, and let's see. Let me go through some of these questions really quick. And I'm also going to pull up uh, a link for a day hike. So I want to thank all of you for joining me today uh, with this very brief presentation. As I mentioned, I do guide trips throughout the year and work with all skill levels and abilities. Gear rentals are included, uh, as well as camping permits, and I'm fully insured as well and certified. Uh, and so if you go to this link that I just shared in the comments, that's kind of a, a thank you from me to all of you for joining me. It's a day hike that I put together for Prospect Mountain in Litchfield Hills. You'll see the whole trip planning process that I went over uh, today, the gear that I chose for this specific hike, and then we go out together and do the hike. Uh, in the video so you can kind of see what you'd be looking at for that area. It was a lot different when I went than it is now with all the snow that we got. So just factor that in with your trip planning if you choose to go here. But it's more just to, to help give you an idea of what you might want to look to do before going out for a winter hike. And also uh, see what the terrain is like for this hike. It's a really cool area. It has a lot of rich history. 18th century uh, nickel mines and iron mines out there. Uh, so thank you for joining me and let me see what questions we have. Uh, yes, the bulky bottle is a Nalgene bottle. So thank you for that question. Um, any other questions? Yes, uh, Lisa, the plastic bags over the feet. So with that, I'll just take this slow cooker liner bag, which opens up just like this. And I got this, you can get them at ShopRite, Stop and Shop, any grocery store. Uh, bread bags or turkey bags work as well. And I'll put my foot, my skin inside of this. And then I'll take my sock and I'll slide my sock over this with my foot inside of it. And then I'll put my footwear on. I also use this in three season trips with non waterproof footwear to help prevent trench foot or getting blistering from happening. Uh, again, this is not breathable, so you will get sweat building up in there, but it will help give you a nice low cost option at giving you additional warmth and uh, additional wind block if you need it. You could go with waterproof breathable socks too. They do make those. Uh, I have a pair from a brand called Showers Pass for cycling, and those work really well at blocking cold as well. Um, any other questions? Thank you, Sue. Thank you, Alicia. Uh, thanks, Marcus. Um, yeah, I, so again, if you want to come out with me, uh, www.reachyoursummit.net, 
you can go to uh, the website and look up the group trips and events tab and see everything that we have going on for this year. We have stuff uh, around Connecticut, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Vermont. All gear rentals and meals are included. We have a very strict COVID protocol that we've been following along with working with uh, public and local health officials for each state and the nonprofit organizations and their requests as well. So uh, it's a very safe and enjoyable experience. And uh, all right, yeah. Uh, if there aren't any other questions, again, I'd like to thank you all for joining me today. Hopefully, uh, you'll find these tips to help you out a lot in your winter hikes this year. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to get in touch with me. All right. And thank you. Uh, for the people that ha have come out with me in the past and your recommendations and uh, your comments, I'm humbled by those. Thank you. I greatly appreciate it. They've been great experiences with you, and I look forward to getting out there with you again in the future and any newcomers that will be coming out as well. All right. Uh, if there aren't any, any other questions, I'm going to end this live stream. Uh, and this is fun. This is my first live stream, so I'll have to get one of these going again in the, the near future uh, so I can interact with all of you a bit more during the challenging times that we're in. All right. All right. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Uh, and definitely uh, stick around and check out the other organizations that are part of um, Connecticut Deep's Winter Festival today, too. They have a lot of great programming going on until 3 o'clock. But thank you for joining me for uh, this session.